Hello and welcome to tonight at 8 from the RSGB. The Microbitex employs Arduino and SDR technology to make an easy to build CW and SSB transceiver kit which brings amateurs a multiband radio at very low cost. But now its designer Asha Farhan VU2ESE is creating a new more sophisticated model based around a Raspberry Pi and called the SBitex and tonight he's going to share with us that journey. So a very warm welcome to tonight at 8 Farhan and a special thank you as well for doing this live since I know it's now in the early hours of the morning for you uh, in India. Can you give us a quick overview of what you'll be covering this evening? Sure. Um, good morning, uh, Dave and Tam. Um, it's about 1.30 a.m. here, so you'll have to excuse if I become slow <laughs> for a while. But um, uh, the idea really is this, you know, I mean, first, it's a great honor and pleasure and, you know, the great happiness I'm here. And I would like to uh, trace the journey from Bitex to SBTX as a part of a personal history of, you know, how I'm, uh, you know, I've progressed to where I am, uh, starting with, you know, my childhood, uh, childhood influences, some of it, not all. Uh, where RSDB plays a fairly you know important role, um, and 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 show the evolution of this radio from really simple primitive circuits to where SBTX is now, uh, and that it can still remain pretty simple to understand. So the whole idea is to build understandable rigs, and I hope to cover that in the next one hour. Wonderful. And well, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. We're really looking forward to this as well. Uh, before the presentation, though, a reminder to you at home that if you're watching this on Monday, November the 1st, then this is live and you can ask questions and make comments on either BATC or YouTube at any time during the presentation or straight afterwards. Please include your first name and your call sign if you have one within each message. Also, please note that you can make this video stream fill your screen on most devices, usually by double clicking on the picture or pressing the full screen button. But now it's time to go back to Farhan to travel the journey of Bitex to SBitex. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Dave. And uh, um, the, uh, you know, my earliest childhood memories are actually, you know, uh, they are about radio. And um, uh, I remember that dad bought a new radio uh, to uh, listen in in 1969 to, for the moonshot. And we heard it live. And, uh, and the radio that we heard all is this. And um, uh, this radio still remains with me. I mean, it's right sitting right next to me even now. I took this picture yesterday. It's a short wave radio. Um, uh, and my dad bought it because a salesman convinced him that it's got something called a printed circuit board, which uh, makes it work better than other radios. Nevertheless, the important thing about this was that it had a shortwave band called 41 meters, which could actually tune into ham radio bands, although it did not have a BFO. Um, but nevertheless, I liked listening onto this radio quite a bit. Uh, and for a long time, I uh, wanted to also be able to build stuff which could put voice back into the radio. Uh, that's a transmitter. Some of my family members worked at the All India Radio locally here. And dad wrote some plays. My mom read out her short stories. So although uh, none of them had much to do with science, I nevertheless got hooked on to radio early. But, you know, I, I just wanted to be able to build circuits which could put voice into the radio. So um, I happened to get onto this book called Having Fun with Transistors. Um, and there was one circuit in it called the Home Home Broadcaster, which promised exactly that, which is to be able to throw voice into a radio across the room. And you can see the circuit on the top right here, which is a fairly simple two transistor radio. Now, <laughs> the problem was that these transistors were not germanium, but as they say, unobtainium, because there was no way to get that transistor here. Nor could I get a thing called loop stick, the, the inductor which is given here, which is some sort of a permeability tunable inductor uh, that uh, Len Buckwater had used. Um, and there was no way to build this. 
although I did gather all components, I spent a lot of money buying NPN transistors in place of these PNP transistors and things just didn't work. And it was a pretty frustrating time for me because these all circuits were coming from the United States um, and there was no way to get anything similar to that, nor was there anybody to guide me as to how to do this. Although my uncle did try a lot, uh, he actually gifted me the first so of my soldering irons, which probably is the worst soldering iron I've ever used. I still have it. I have a lot of old stuff <laughs> that I do keep collecting. Anyway, but uh, to make it short, it was fairly frustrating. And then, uh, magically so, when I was in the sixth stand standard, um, one day evening, I walked into the physics lab and found a bunch of people demonstrating ham radio. And I found my gang, so to say. Uh, these people were all in their 40s and 50s, and I was all of 11 years old. Uh, but I knew that there were a bunch of people who wanted uh, and could build radios which went two ways. And they had a valve uh, transmitter, AMCW transmitter, and a receiver which they call as HRO. This is exactly that receiver. And subsequently, when I became friends with them and one of them was disposing this receiver off, uh, I bought it of that person and I still have it in my collection. Uh, this is an HRO. It's a pretty early HRO. I would imagine that this is 1942 or 43. I'm not really sure. Um, I haven't restored it entirely yet. It does work, but it sort of works. But nevertheless, the whole idea that evening was that seven megahertz had opened at you know, 5 p.m. and they were able to talk to Bombay from here. It's about 800 kilometers away, about 500 miles. Um, and it wasn't just that this radio was able to talk across the room or even across the city, but across the nation and continents and that completely blew my mind that it was possible for regular folks. Uh, these were folks who were working in some public sector organizations, the government, some were teachers. One of them even happened to be my own geography teacher and I never knew this, but it really impacted me a lot. And I just hung on to these guys and between all of them, they had one ARRL handbook and it was, you know, not only called the Bible, but it was treated like a Bible in the sense that kids were not allowed to touch it. Um, you know, it was used with a lot of reverence and only trusted people were given that because I, I guess that it was just one handbook for the entire city. So that was always a problem for me to, uh, you know, find out more and more about this incredible hobby, except to sit with these people and you know, hear about them. But then... <clears throat> I discovered the British Library and I discovered this book of Pat Hawkers there. Now, incredibly enough, the local British Council Library here, uh, firstly, was very kid friendly and it had a shelf of two shelves actually of electronics books. And one of them was entirely filled with RSGB books. Of them, the radio communication handbook was never available. I have no idea what happened, whether it was stolen away or I don't know what, but the amateur radio techniques had um, a lot of circuits that I did not understand, but there were these two of Pat's circuits, which really um, uh, were approachable for me because they were just one transistor stuff. So what you see on the right is of course, just a one transistor transmitter. And what you see on the left in the center is actually a VFO, which is working at seven megahertz. And the idea was that you tune this VFO to seven megahertz and your regular shortwave broadcast radio that I showed in my first slide would beat this together. And you would be able to receive and resolve SSB and CW on a regular shortwave radio. Uh, so it was a two knob tuning uh, one was to be able to tune the radio onto the signal, and second is to net the VFO onto the signal. Um, 
it's actually much tougher than what I'm telling you because I did not have a variable capacitor. Instead, I had to tune the slug to exactly zero beat with the, with the signals, but with about 20, 25 feet of wire up on my roof. Uh, and this circuit, I could sort of start resolving the SSB and CW signals on seven megahertz. And I would listen to fascination, you know, my own friends across the town and, you know, across the country and resolve the signals and on a good day even get a couple of DXM. But the big problem still remained of a transmitter. And the problem was that I wouldn't have access to a crystal at seven megahertz to be able to transmit and specifically to transmit on the frequencies that I was interested in. So as a result, I couldn't make much headway getting on air for a long time. And the circuits that we saw in the ARRL handbook uh, or for that matter, even uh, in the RSGB handbooks, I think there was a Pat Hawker's book called um, Guide to Amateur Radio, if I'm not mistaken, but you know, maybe that, uh, I don't have access to that book now, but uh, Amateur Radio Techniques I eventually bought and I still have uh, two editions of them at home. So uh, nevertheless, that, was, that still remained a challenge for me. And this was one of the circuits developed locally here, which promised SSB signal. It was developed by VU2NR and uh, Raju. And as you can see here, it was full of Indian transistors, uh, but it had slug tuned coils and I just couldn't make any head or tail out of this. You know, in the middle of the circuit diagram, if you, if you can you know, resolve this, you can see that there is a nine megahertz filter. Now, I would have problems getting a seven megahertz crystal, leave alone an SSB crystal filter. So where do you get this from? Um, eventually, uh, someone handed one over to me. I had no idea how that person had gotten it, but I was asking so many people around that somebody sort of pitied and you know dropped one in my lap. And I managed to get this circuit assembled uh, and somebody asked and asked somebody to you know tune it up for me because there's a lot of tuning involved as you can see here. So it's it's a, it's a little like the Epiphyte um, SSB transceiver in retrospect. The the three transistor you know blocks are, are essentially four mixers uh, clustered around a seven uh, a nine megahertz fil crystal fil filter and you know the active mixers very much like C8. 3028 or the NE612s. Uh, I sort of got it going, but not really. I suspect that it was self oscillating a lot. So it sort of was just semi successful for me to get on air with this on SSB. But in the meantime, I had got the MOPA transmitter going, which was uh, an EF91 and a 6L6, which was built by a friend of mine, uh, Amar. Uh, Victor United to Alpha Alpha Papa. Uh, so I got, I got on air with this contraption, which was a um, free running oscillator at uh, a VFO at seven megahertz, a Wolf VFO, which directly drove a 6L6. And I used that VFO to beat signals on my shortwave broadcast radio. And I finally got on air and I started making contacts on CW. Uh, it was a great time. Uh, you know, the sunspot activity was really high and, you know, I was young and there was very little to do. I was in senior high. So, you know, it was good time uh, all in all. Uh, then for a long time, I took a break uh, from the hobby. You know, I, I got onto other things. I discovered literature, music, uh, finally got married until I landed up on this book. And in the meantime, I had lost my original call sign. And I had also mo been moving houses, so there was no way of putting up the antenna. So finally, when I, you know, we bought this place and moved in here, uh, a friend of mine bought this book for me, The Experimental Methods in RF Design. And this really entirely changed my approach to building radios. And as you can see, there are two copies of this uh, that are here. There's a completely torn out copy. The first four or five pages are gone. Uh, which is the copy that I use. And the second copy is more or less a collectible uh, 
for a very special reason that it's actually signed by Wes Hayward, Rick Campbell, and Bob Larkin. So uh, eventually when I did go and have an eyeball with each of them, I made them sign this copy and this remains one of my most prized possessions in the shack. So the big deal about uh, this book was that it had a very simple uh, direct conversion receiver. Uh, and I'm putting this up here. This is probably the simplest circuit diagram uh, available in that book. And as you can see that it's just three bipolar transistors and this makes it into a full-fledged, very high performance actually, very high performance. It's stable, it's low noise, it has no harm in it, uh, but it's a direct conversion receiver. And uh, I thought that this was one circuit that I could start building but on the top left, as you see that there is a crystal filter attached here. And I said, my God, now what do I do? <laughs> okay, sorry, uh, this, this crystal, seven megahertz crystal. I don't have access to seven megahertz crystal. So, and the internet hadn't really, you know, kicked into the level that I could order these online and get them quickly in India. So um, this was proving to be a challenge. And what I thought I could do is get on to the second le least complicated circuit, which was this, it was called the S7C receiver in this book. Uh, and this uh, still used a crystal uh, oscillator as the VXO here. But I thought that I could substitute this with a VFO, which I already knew how to build from you know my bygone days. And I thought that this would be a good thing to replicate. And as you can see here that there is a, you know, on the bottom right, there is a two crystal filter, a crystal filter with just two crystals. And there are, uh, there's an IF amplifier before and after that. Um, I don't know whether you'll be able to see me move my mouse, but you see that these are two IF amplifiers. Now, the big deal about these IF amplifiers, which struck me right then was that they did not use inductors. They just use resistors here and there. And toroids were very hard to come by in India. In fact, impossible. Uh, I hadn't actually seen a physical toroid all my life. Um, so this, I thought, is a circuit that could be built. Now, there were still transformers, um, you know, here in the mixer output and in the detectors, um, you know, trans transformer here. So um, I... I needed a way to make these. And I knew that these were broadband and I had to um, improvise here and somehow you know, get these other coils going as well. But the most inspirational thing about uh, experimental methods and RF design was that it asked you to build these one block at a time and it split things into very simple stuff. It said that there are just four different circuits that you need to know. You need to know your amplifiers, how to build an amplifier, how to build a filter, how to build an oscillator, and how to build a mixer. Now, with these four blocks, you combine them in various ways and get any kind of radio going. So if you could build one amplifier, you could build another amplifier exactly the same way and scale it up or down. If you knew how to build one bandpass filter, then you could build as many bandpass filters as you needed. But in order to do this, instead of starting to build a radio, you needed to build some test equipment first. So um, this was in two pages, uh, Wes had solved this entire conundrum of how to get access to a crystal filter. He said you could build one yourself. And the way to build this actually uh, came in another book, uh, which is here. This is um, an article which is reprinted from, a, from QST and it's available with the QRP Classics book, which said that you could, you didn't have to have crystals which were 1.5 kilohertz apart as most of the other books were saying, but same crystal, same frequency. So you just take a bunch of crystals of the same frequency and use these capacitors, which are coupling it to the ground. And the higher the capacitance, the smaller the bandwidth and greater the capacitance then um, you know narrower the bandwidth. 
and within the bandwidth you can control the ripple inside it by changing the termination at the two ends so it was pretty simple you know just keep changing the capacitance until you hit the 2.5 kilohertz magical bandwidth and then you change the the resistance on the both sides or rather the termination impedances on both sides until it flattens out on the top now the 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 interesting thing was that the ripple on the top of your uh one second let me go back yeah so here if 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 you see on the stop it's flat topped here now if if there's a ripple in this uh and you wanted to or wanted the ripple to go away then you would just raise the resistance but as you raise the resistance the slope became shallower so the ripple and the slope of the filter were sort of reciprocal to each other now once i got that then i did not need too much of maths to figure this out and all you needed to do was you know just keep experimenting until you figured it out but the important thing here was that you know because a, a crystal filter is a, a crystal in a filter acts like a series a uh, resonating circuit with a coil and a capacitor in series with each other you needed to know what the capacitance or the inductance was to figure out the other one so that you could actually you know mathematically do this stuff and uh, dr gordon uh, g3 uur had a very simple circuit to measure that and uh, this was the circuit uh, published in the em rfd as well as uh, with uh, you know technical topics very simple you know crystal oscillator and what you did is that you put your crystal between this 33 pf and the base of this transistor uh, and measured the frequency and then changed and took this 33 pf off and put the crystal directly between the base of this transistor and the ground and there would be a shift in the crystal's frequency of course and the shift dependent uh, was dependent on the internal capacitance of that particular crystal so i built the circuit fairly simple to do um and you know i could see that it's oscillating which was good news but i needed to measure the exact frequency of oscillations so this led me to some of my first test gear projects and this is my simple uh, you know home lab to begin with so what you see here in the bottom is my crystal uh, oscillator i had a uh, i had a, a frequency counter and this is a signal generator which i had built um, i have scavenged some parts out of it but it still works uh, the on off switch and the band switch is gone it's it's just doing one uh, band right now but it's got, essentially got a broadcast radio uh capacitor inside it so it's it's a large uh, bandwidth vfo it goes from 6 to 30 megahertz and it gives one output there's a parallel output which went to the frequency counter but the frequency counter used to be noisy so you had to switch off the frequency counter when you're doing measurements and on the other side i had an rf probe uh which was used to uh see the slopes of the crystal filters and this got me going with a number of things including uh being able to measure inductances of any coil that i wound and that was actually a fairly simple thing to do i probably have a uh, a circuit uh, a picture of that somewhere so with this i managed to build not a receiver but a whole transceiver based on the s 7c circuit of the emrfd which is this it's a dual band ssb transceiver and this was my first uh rig that i managed to build on my own entirely you can see that there is a four crystals crystal filter here and we'll just come to the circuit in a little bit so this here is the is the entire circuit of this radio uh the upper part here uh which is the if is is exactly from the s7c circuit diagram uh, instead of using two fets i just used one because fets were very difficult to come by although they were man being manufactured in india this is a bfw10 
So this was the VFO. And actually, it's, it's, it's a fairly simple uh, circuit that on the top left here is the input of the receiver, which is a dual uh, tuned uh, circuit, band pass filter. It comes to a VFW10, which is a mixer. Uh, and the mixer passes it on to post IF amplifier, crystal filter. Then there is a detector here. And then you have an LM380. And on transmit, what happens is the IF uh, fil filter and the IF chain remains what it is. But instead of uh, the, the signal coming from the receiver front end, now you have uh, a, another um, uh, BFO here. The BFO here feeds the modulator and the modulated signal from the mic, the DSB is fed. You know, one of the side bands is stripped off. And now the modulator, uh, what was earlier the demodulator is used as a transmit mixer. And then it feeds to the transmit chain here with an IRF 510. So this actually worked pretty well. Uh, we did a lot of DXing, but I didn't have my own call sign by then. I had applied for it. So the first of the few contacts actually were made by my friend Paddy, VU2PEP. And that um, actually proved that this was pretty stable. And it was nice, except that it had a lot of switching happening here uh, when it went from receive to transmit as, you know, because, uh, and it required two pairs of um, bandpass filters, one for transmit, one for receive, et cetera. So that was um, the first transceiver I made, um, but it had its own drawbacks in terms of switching a lot of things around. So um, I'm just, this is a, you know, a clearer picture of the receiver part here. Uh, fairly simple. And as you can see, I'm using a three and uh, so a, a two and three eight six six, um, you know, for all my uh, HF work because I did not realize that the BC 548s, which I had a lot of them in my junk box, could be used at HF because I hadn't yet seen a circuit which used these audio transistors. I, I'm, you know, after making this, it struck me that, oh God, this is already has an FT of 300 megahertz and it can be used for uh, HF work. Uh, so these transistors, uh, the, the 2N3866, uh, costed approximately 100 rupees, which is you know, about one and a half pounds here in those days. Whereas the BC548 was about five rupees, which is, you know, what a, I mean, it's about two cents. And now it's even cheaper. So uh, with that in mind, and this was my uh, coils collection at that time. As you can see that there are, you know, no toroids. Um, I still have this box, but what I did have here instead of toroids, what is what you see on the right hand here. Now these were sold uh, for the terrestrial television, which was the only television we had here in those days. We had just one national channel, the Doodarshan, and it had, it used a folded, uh, Yagi antennas on the top of our houses. And to convert that to 75 ohms, we had this double barrel kind of a thing, uh, which took in uh, balanced 300 ohms on one side and gave out 75 unbalanced on the other side. So I ripped these out and I started winding broadband RF um, transformers on this, as you can see here on the right. Now for toroids, the thing that I, Park was available here were these tap washers or the faucet washers. So these were put inside the taps uh, to, to close the valve when you tighten the faucet down and you know close the tap uh, completely. So I bought a couple of these. They were you know literally for free uh, and wound started winding coils on this. And then what I did was I had the simple circuit here. Uh, which is, you know, between two RF connectors, you have a series strap, so to say a coil and a capacitor. And if you knew what the capacitance was, uh, you could see a dip at some frequency as you swept the signal generator and you knew. And if you knew where the dip was coming, then you could back calculate knowing the, uh, the capacitor, what the inductance was. And that's how I started building inductors using these nylon uh, toroids, uh, which are basically tap washers. And with that, you know, you could know the inductance 
And what the EMRFD also taught me is that I could even measure the Q of the coil as to how good the coil was by just looking at the depth of this uh, notch here. So with a fairly primitive circuit, I was able to build coils without having to have access to the toroids. Now, this was the original uh, feedback amplifier, which I had used in the dual band radio uh, from EMRFD. So in order to avoid switching, I thought, what if we can make the radio go bidirectional? And I had seen a, a circuit of this in the SSB handbook published by the ARRL. So I thought that maybe if we build something like this, which is here on the right-hand side, it would work. And it did work. Uh, again, I swept it with my signal generator and my RF probe. I think by then I had also you know, got a friend to carry a very heavy uh, Tektronics 465 oscilloscope, uh, with, which really you know, upped my game. But as, as you can see that there are diodes which I've inserted into the collector at the wrong place, actually, on this circuit. Um, the output capacitor, this capacitor should have been on between the resistor, the, the collector load, and this diode to prevent it from you know, getting into the uh, collector of the switched off transistor. But by just you know, giving power to either of these two transistors, I could change the direction of amplification here. And both the circuits are the same. So if you could make one circuit with these, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, six resistors and four capacitors um, and get this amplifier going, then you strap two of them back to back and that becomes a bidirectional amplifier. So this was actually the key block uh, to what became the Bitex. So uh, this is the entire Bitex um, circuit. And the the best thing about this was that I could see the entire circuit. I mean, you can see the entire circuit on your screens right now and probably you know, even read some of those values in. Uh, there were very few inductors here and the total component cost of building this radio was about 500 rupees, which is you know, about five pounds. And the reason for that was that I used these BC548s uh, everywhere. Um, because these were fairly commonly available uh, of the radio shops here. And the inductors here, the triple tuned circuit um, were wound on tap washers and the coils for, um, or rather the, the, the transformers for uh, the diode mixers were, were wound on these TV balloon cores. And this, um, I wasn't really sure of how well this would work. I was on a flight back from Sweden coming to India uh, and I sketched this on the flight. I didn't have much with me. I had the EMRFD book and I had a uh, calculator built into my phone. And with that, I managed to draw this out. When I came home, I sat down and I was very excited. So I first built one amplifier, stabbed it back to back, uh, saw that it was working. Now, if you see here, uh, these two transistors here um, make this, this feedback amplifier. And the same block is actually replicated three times over. So I didn't have to learn to do anything new. I just had to make the same block without making mistakes. And I could refer to the voltages of the previous block to see what the correct voltages would have been um, or, 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 or should be uh, when I was making this. So uh, I reused this exactly the same circuit here, which is the good thing about Bitex, which is that if you could if you can build one single transistor amplifier, then if you just take time to build another six of them, uh, and you know, with total seven amplifiers, you are in business. Actually, eight. Even this amplifier here, which amplifies the VFO is the same. Not only that, but even the oscillators were exactly the same circuit diagram. So I'll just come to that here. So you, you, you'd remember that this is the test oscillator um, that I was using to characterize my crystal filters. Um, so here I had, apart from the 33 PF, I also had a 330 PF here onto which I could actually 
solder an inductor across this and then measure the frequency and figure out what the inductance was because I already knew what the capacitance was, which was sort of you know re resonating with that. So I use exactly the same circuit here to make the VFO, which is, uh, you know, I've put an inductor and a capacitor in place of the crystal filter here. And I used a, a, a broadcast variable capacitor here to tune across the band. And because I had no access to a slow motion drive, I added a varactor tuning for the fine tuning here. So it was a two knob tuning uh, bands uh, band, uh, band spread here, and this was the fine tuning. Um, but if you see that this, these two circuits, um, the the BFO and the VFO are exactly the same, uh, because one thing when it started working working for me, I had no reason to not use it and overuse it all, all over again. So if you again go back to the bit X, it used the same circuit blocks all over. And here, if you see this amplifier, it is still the same micro R1 amplifier, which I had started with in the direction, uh, in the direct conversion radio. So really the only circuit, which was mine was this mic amplifier. The rest were all blocks, which I had early encountered in other people's designs. Uh, so the, the Bitex actually became a fairly popular design uh, mostly because it was very simple. Uh, it was simple to understand, simple to build. It was extremely resilient to the kinds of substitutions that people could make. And Doug Hendricks uh, started kitting it as Bitex 20A. Uh, this is Bill Miara's uh, scratch built uh, Bitex. Um, an Indian company uh, started giving out single side boards, which could be populated with this. It looks pretty much like a heat kit. And some people went fairly overboard with this and built this into a multi-band uh, versions with a lot of switching of band pass filters, etc. And uh, I actually started a small company uh, which started to kit these radios. And you know, you can see some of these radios here. Uh, this is the first of the batch getting ready to be shipped out. Uh, what had happened was that when, when this design was announced on uh, rec.radio.amateur.homebrew, uh, rec uh, I think that was the news group, then Hans uh, Golf Zero United Papa Lima uh, and RV1's uh, Kilo 7 Portal Kilo Lima, they uh, got interested in this and Hans started to put a group by for, for the com components of these. And he needed a um, place to coordinate this with. So he started a Yahoo group, uh, which exists to this date, although we have migrated to groups.io. So I should really be thankful for Hans and Arv to have bootstrapped the entire movement around the Bitex radio. And Hans remains a very close friend of mine. Um, and we uh, work off each other and we get inspired by each other. Um, and it's it's a it's a it's a pleasure and an honor to be uh, closely associated with his work. He's one of the most diligent radio hams, and uh, his own website hanssummers.com uh, is a testimony to how thoroughly he investigates stuff. Whether it was whether it's you know varactor tuning using LEDs or huff and puff or whatever catches his fancy. So. Um, the Bitex actually did very well. And then I decided that the analog tuning has to go in order to uh, work the digital modes. So using an Arduino, I built, this is the first uh, of the radio nodes as it's called, which is a radio version of Arduino, where the Arduino is coupled to an SI5351. So this was the first version of that. And this was produced as a PCB2 and this could plug into the Bitex and control that. And that with that, the Bitex became a digitally tunable uh, radio. Uh, and subsequently, uh, my interests led me to building a spectrum analyzer. And I built the spectrum analyzer because I just couldn't buy one in India. So this uh, is a scratch built spectrum analyzer. It's ba based on Wes Hayward's design. And um, uh, this, 
is what the spectrum analyzer's block diagram looks like. Now, people imagine that a spectrum analyzer is an extremely complicated device. It is not. It's just a receiver where the, the it's a super hit receiver, actually. And the first oscillator where you tune it with basically sweeps frequencies under an Arduino's control. And instead of having an SSB product detector, the detector is actually an AM detector, which um, measures the amplitude of the signal. But instead of an S meter, it's, it's far more accurate and precise. And that is plotted on, uh, on a screen. Uh, you know, so frequency versus amplitude. It's as simple as that. But this gave me the, the, the confidence of building a dual conversion radio. So this basically takes 0 to 70 megahertz in and upconverts this to 112 megahertz where there's a bandpass band filter. So I learned to build bandpass filters at 112 megahertz, then converts it down to uh, 10 megahertz IF where I have two... Um, Two different bandpass filters that I can switch. One is a 400 kilohertz wide for a wide sweep, and the other is a one kilohertz wide, which is for a narrow sweep. So fairly simple, uh, but it upped my game to be able to measure distortion, to be able to measure harmonics, to figure out how well a, a filter is doing without having to manually plot the uh, the bandpass shapes by noting stuff down on a notebook, you know, frequency by frequency. But instead, I could just see this entire thing visually. Uh, and this is the circuit diagram of that spectrum analyzer. And this actually has bearing on the micro bit X, and as I will come to shortly. So here is an SI570 oscillator, which is feeding the first mixer of a low pass filter. Then there is an IF amplifier, post, post mix IF amplifier, a VHF band pass filter. The second filter converts it down. Uh, IF amplifier at 10 megahertz. Uh, this is followed by um, crystal filters. So either you have a crystal filter here or uh, an LC filter, uh, which then feed to more IF amplifiers and finally to the log amp power meter as the detector, which is an AD8307. So again, a fairly simple circuit, which can fit into one page. So you can see it all together. And at this time, I didn't have... A, even a way of actually laying out these PC, uh, the schematics, and this was entirely done in MS Word by uh, copy pasting, uh, you know, individual components, uh, diagrams, and drawing lines. Uh, now, with this, uh, I realized that it was possible to use a low pass filter and up convert to a frequency which is higher than all the frequencies coming in. And that way you could avoid a bandpass filter and you could have a wide range uh, receiver going, which in, in case of the spectrum analyzer was zero to 70 megahertz. And then I started thinking about why can't we apply the same principles to a regular radio? Uh, let's say go zero to 30 megahertz. Now, instead of the complications of a dual conversion radio, I thought it might be easier if we just use a high IF like 20 megahertz. Uh, so what would happen is, let's say, imagine that you are at 80 meters or 3.5 megahertz, uh, and you had to convert this to 20 megahertz. So you would use a VFO at 23.5 megahertz, right? And that, uh, and the image would be at 20 plus 23.5 megahertz, which is 43 megahertz, which you can easily filter off with a 30 megahertz filter. There was, of course, a problem of IF breakthrough. That is, if you have a 20 megahertz crystals and 20 megahertz, have, I picked up because that was the highest frequency crystals available in the local market here. Uh, so um, I designed a radio called Minima. Some people, uh, mostly in Britain, actually, even attempted to make this along with me. And this was the Minima radio. So as you can see that this is a fairly simple radio. I'm starting from here. There's a low pass filter. I'll come to this part in a bit. A low pass filter uh, feeds to a passive FET mixer, uh, which is fed by an SI570 as a local oscillator under Arduino's control. And this goes to a 20 megahertz SSB filter. There's a bi-directional IF amplifier 
which feeds to the detector or modulator, depending on the direction in which the signal is flowing. And of course, you know, from here it goes to an audio preamplifier and to uh, an audio amplifier here. Now, the thing was that this is at 20 megahertz and you are trying to receive signals between zero and 30 megahertz, right? So there's a good possibility that something on 20 megahertz will also make through uh, this crystal filter. Uh, <clears throat> so what I had done was there's a switching between uh, two filters, one was zero to four, 14 megahertz and the other started from above 14, around 18 megahertz and it went to 30 megahertz with a trap for 20 megahertz. This didn't work too well here. Um, and the reason for that was that there wasn't enough of IF rejection. And more importantly, the KISS, fill, the KISS mixer here, which I had used, had a lot of local oscillator leakage and the local oscillator was mixing and producing a lot of spurious radiation, which is which are coming out of this. Nevertheless, the design was pretty clean. And the other important thing here, which I used was that these IF amplifiers, which are being used here, were designed by Wes Hayward specifically for the Bitex radios. And they used not one, but three transistors each. And the remaining two transistors did uh, an amazing thing that they transformed the 220 ohms into a 50 ohms output impedance. And the, the best part about this amplifier block was that the input impedance and the out, output impedance were independent of each other. So the termination was, the output termination did not change the input termination and the input termination did not affect the output termination which is otherwise the case with feedback amplifiers. So uh, these blocks were validated here and the radio actually worked pretty well. It was only on the transmit side that one had a lot of problems with this, but it was simple. It was actually simpler in a lot of ways compared to the Bitex and much higher performance. And I had integrated the Arduino itself as, a, as an integral part of this radio uh, here. So um, this is the second version that I built because of the 20 megahertz IF problems, I thought that I should go back and do a dual conversion radio. So I, the next radio which I built was called HF1. And this was a, an up converting radio where you took zero to 30 megahertz signals, mix it up to 45 megahertz bandpass filter because the IF now uh, being 45 megahertz, the images were 45 megahertz and above, and they were easily stripped by the slow pass filter. Uh, then you bring this 45 megahertz signal down to 10 megahertz, uh, and then you know do your detection or modulation, whatever. And this is a picture of uh, this radio as it was built. And this is a circuit diagram. It's, I mean, you know, there isn't much to write home about, except that this is now beginning to look much like the micro bitex. Um, in the sense that there's a low pass filter of zero to 30 megahertz followed by a diode mixer, which <laughs> mixes it up when you're receiving to 45 megahertz. There is an IF amplifier followed by 45 megahertz bandpass filter, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then it, it converts it down to 11 megahertz uh, after 45 megahertz filtering. Uh, and here is, um, uh, is the product... Uh, uh, detector being fed by the BFO. So this was essentially a dual conversion radio, uh, again, uh, controlled by an Arduino Nano uh, using an SI570 because it's got very low noise uh, attributes. And most importantly, it's an SMD IC, which I could solder with my regular soldering iron. I didn't require any special tools to solder it. Um, this had problems of this 45 megahertz um, bandpass filter picking up all this other stuff and re, you know, introducing it back into the circuit diagram. So I could never really get this out the door in a usable format where this, where the spurious uh, signals were you know, within control and within limits. 
uh, but nevertheless it gave me a taste of what it is like to build a dual conversion radio and i realized two things one was that getting this 55 megahertz oscillator as a second oscillator to convert the 45 megahertz down to 10 was quite difficult because it was an overtone oscillator and you needed to tune the collector of this oscillator exactly at the third harmonic at 55 megahertz which was not easy for most of the radio hands to accomplish because they did not they wouldn't have any you know equipment to measure 55 megahertz they would usually probably have another radio which could go to 28 or 30 megahertz but nothing at 55 so i decided to switch this away from a crystal filters you know here and even in the bfo and instead of it use an si5351 which has three clock outputs which could feed all these three clock requirements that is the first oscillator the second oscillator and the bfo so with that uh the the design of the microbitex was in place and this is the microbitex design so essentially it is um a 0 to 30 megahertz low pass filter and this is fed by an si5351 which converts it up to 45 megahertz and at 45 megahertz we use a ceramic filter to 15 kilohertz wide which is commonly available for uh, not so commonly available now actually uh but it it was used in cordless telephones i mean cordless telephones have now gone out the door uh then it's converted down to um uh, 11 megahertz now the reason of using the second if and having crystals here instead of 45 megahertz directly is that at 45 megahertz you cannot realize ssb bandwidth it's too narrow at 45 megahertz which is why you need a crystal filter at 11 12 megahertz to have a decent uh ssb filtering going on here uh so you 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 take the signal coming 0 to 30 megahertz depending on the local oscillator convert one of those signals to 45 then down convert 45 to 11 and then you know demodulate it and the the transmit essentially works off in the other direction you know so you take audio up convert it to uh, dsb at 11.059 megahertz filter one of the side bands and then up convert it to 45 then down convert to 0 to 30 megahertz so this is a fairly you know simple conventional design except that uh, all the blocks are familiar and fairly primitive i should say uh, and you could still uh, fit this into a single uh, board and this is the prototype of the microbitex uh, which i had taken to the fdim i think of 2018 uh, and i released this design there and then we shortly went into production after that for this um unfortunately uh, other kit builders uh, or other kitting companies did not pick up this design so we were the only people who were doing this although all these designs are open source designs so no one has to ask anybody's permission to do these um most of my radios are actually pictured kept on some book or the other which is an inspiration for that radio and this um uh, radio which is the microbitex borrowed heavily from introduction to rf design by wes hayward w7zy so this uh, book is actually at the base of this radio literally and figuratively and this is our um website and this reads microbitex lets you explore the world and you could see where <laughs> the inspiration for this came from um down to the sort of knobs that this uses um and um i mean this is a nod to some of our favorites where the catalog said that uh, hot water 101 is a five band ssb cw transceiver with features you need for operating ease um and here i wrote that it's a general coverage 10 watts hf ssb transceiver kit with features you need for operating ease convenience and versatility so <laughs> this is a small uh, easter egg here but nevertheless the idea was to essentially uh, replace my ft817 with a homebrew set and i managed to do it with this design and this is the this is my own build of the 
microbitex. It's essentially the same microbitex, but in a with a color display. The radio remains the same. It's just that the uh, the, the two line LCD display, which goes with the uh, Arduino, is swapped by a TFT display. Uh, but uh, apart from that, it's a very nice box, laser cut uh, and milled by my friend Sanjay VU3NOV. And this is the set that I usually use when I get on air with the Microbitex. So, um, okay, now uh, let me just switch to uh, the SDR and how it evolved from the Microbitex. And here uh, is what the SDR is supposed to do, which is an antenna connected to an analog to digital converter. And this is fed to a computer, right? So, um, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm just taking a little break from uh, discussing, you know, the nuts and bolts of building radios and dipping into a very, or sort of skimming through a little bit of SDR theory so that one appreciates what you know the challenge is like. So you connect the antenna to something called an analog to dig digital converter, which essentially digitizes the signals and feeds it into a computer where you can now process in software all the signals and pick up the signal that you want, leave the others out, amplify it, you know, and then play it through the speaker. So very simply put, if there's a wave that you would like to capture uh, a sine wave, you need to at least make two measurements for every uh, up and down of the signal. So a sine wave goes up and then comes down, right? So you need one measurement at the top of the wave and one at the bottom of the wave. So if a wave is going up and down, let's say a million times a second, you need two million samples to be read out for you to accurately know the amplitude of that particular signal. So if you are looking at an HF, all, you know, all HF general coverage radio, you would require 60 million samples to be able to read a 30 megahertz signal. And with about 16 bits to a sample, that is two bytes, uh, you are looking at 120 megabytes of data coming from this A to D into your computer. Conversely, when you're transmitting, you would have same 60 million samples of two bytes each, which is 120 megabytes of data going out from your computer into the digital to analog converter in order to transmit this back. Now, considering that you will require about 1,000 CPU cycles or, you know, thousand instructions to process each one of them saying, okay, put this there, multiply it with this, bring it down, you know, do whatever you need to do with this signal until it hits the speaker or, you know, comes from the mic and hits the antenna. We are talking about a CPU with 120 gigahertz CPU speed. And uh, you could actually buy a computer of the of the specification uh, online, uh, if you have a stock trading account. So this is the computer that you can buy, and that is the price tag. <laughs> uh, the Googleplex gives you that sort of power. Uh, it's not possible to actually have anything <laughs> on your desk, but nevertheless. So what can we do now? You know, we are home brewers. We have <laughs> slightly less. <laughs> then uh, affordance to buy this. So what we do is this. We convert down the signals coming in into audio range. So now um, if you are looking at a span of 50 kilohertz of signal, two, kilo, two bytes again per sample for zero to 50 kilohertz sample, we are now talking of just 200,000 uh, bytes of data per second. And a CPU which can process this with about 1000 CPU cycles is still a 200 megahertz CPU. So now this is finally, which is something that's manageable. And this is what it looks like. So that's a $4 codec, which I hand so soldered onto this board. And I'm extremely proud that my hand is steady enough to 
do a 28 pin you know ssop um, a 40 uh, raspberry pi 4 buys you two cores which are running at about 2 gigahertz it's it's astounding the amount of um, cpu power that's packed in into this computer a uh, small computer and actually um, they have released the the code which will allow you to even run very numerically um, intensive uh, calculations on this at much faster speed than the cpu can do and a 50 dollar uh, display now if you put this stuff together it's not that it will just run your sdr given the fact that it's raspberry pi um it can actually run youtube you know if you wanted to do that uh but uh, more importantly it can run ft8 on the radio okay now let that sink in ft8 without connecting it to a computer it could run cw decoders rtty sstv uh, you know uh, psk31 in addition to satellite tracking in addition to your logging software all inside your radio and you wouldn't have to connect it to a computer you wouldn't have to lug a computer around you wouldn't even have to mess with wires everything stays inside your radio so for the first time you could actually build a radio uh, that did not require a computer uh, and everything worked right in onto your radio's front panel so um now how does this work so here is a as a capture of um, of signals on 7 megahertz band and as you can see here that um, this shaded region which is to the left of this 30 uh, 70 30 uh, kilohertz here is the signal that i'm interested in and and here's a signal that i do not want to hear and i mean i need to filter everything else out so what i need to do here is to be able to hear this particular signal here and now we'll just figure out how that happens right so i need to be able to do a waterfall between 7005 and 7030 kilohertz and be able to pick the signal off right so and now if i put my uh uh where did this go sorry i need to go back and forth here to figure out where i put my signal back okay oh no i think we we'll, i just have to stay here okay so here um now if i put my local oscillator on 7030 to convert this into audio uh the wanted signal on the left here which is less than 7030 on the lower side band does get converted but the signal which is just above it also converts to audio frequency right so uh the the block diagram which i had earlier which is this here doesn't really work what i need is a super head which will now allow me to filter out the image which is coming here the audio image which is coming here and instead if i just had an ssb filter which filtered uh all the bandwidth from 7005 to 7030 which is 25 kilohertz then i would be in business so this is actually what the sbitex architecture looks like so um let me just see if i can show you the architecture but when yeah so this is the sbitex architecture which is that uh now this is an earlier um, you know block diagram uh subsequently i changed the 27 megahertz the if is now 40 megahertz so you take 0 to 30 megahertz low pass filter here uh mix it up to 40 megahertz where we have a crystal filter here uh with 30 kilohertz bandwidth and then we convert this down to audio which is 0 to 40 kilohertz put it into a sound card which is specifically built to work with the raspberry pi so that's actually the simple uh, superhead it's a regular analog superhead which works with the raspberry pi all inside the same box but how do we get there so i'll just go back to some of these slides and show you how that happens now as we keep saying that simulation is a greater experiment so this is the simulation of this radio in terms of the performance that you can expect now the kiss mixer is actually a fairly simple mixer 
uh, I don't know if I'll have time to uh, talk about it, but it's essentially two FETs which keep switching a particular transformer's polarity on and off. And that's in the front end, a low pass filter kiss mixer followed by the crystal filter, uh, which is then followed by uh, uh, IF amplifier. There's an attenuator to provide a good termination for the IF amplifier as well as a demodulator and then audio preamplifier, which feeds to the sound card. So it's actually fairly simple. Um, in fact, primitively simple super head here. And I've put in the gains of each of these and noise figures. By the way, this um, calculator is available on my website called view2esc.com uh, and you can play with these things, right? So you, for each stage, you look at the gain, noise figure, and the distortion factor of those things, and then press this evaluate button. And it's saying that with this, the in-channel bandwidth here is 85 dB. And this is actually a big deal. And let me just, you know, spend a minute to tell you why this is a big deal. Um, now, what happens is, uh, these days that our bands are mostly empty with a lot of activity concentrated on spot frequencies. So, um, for example, uh, 7075 uh, to 70 or rather uh, 7074 to 7077 is where all the FT8 activity happens. So when you have a 2.5 kilohertz SSB bandwidth open to that particular segment, you're looking at about 200 signals all transmitting at once. And if the signal handling capability after your crystal filter is not good enough, these signals will, will stumble over each other, will intermix with each other and cause distortions, which will make it impossible to pick out some of the really low level signals out of that entire uh, pileup uh, which is going on there. So with the advent of digital modes and CW contesting, et cetera, it's the in-channel dynamic range, which is important. And here we would be able to get 85 dB of dynamic range in channel, which has become an extremely important thing these days. And as you can see that here, um, the MDS is still minus 126 dBm, which is, you know, about 0.1 micro uh, volts of minimum discernible signal. So this actually is a pretty good design by, you know, any stretch. It's not the best. It will not top the Sherwood table, but there is no reason why you could not use this even in contests uh, if you do not have very powerful transmitters uh, within your own uh, antenna yard because we're just using a low pass filter here instead of a band pass filter. So in order to make this, the most important thing was to get a 25 kilohertz wide crystal filter going. And I first tried it with the 27 megahertz crystals. So this, these are the first uh, crystal filters, two of them that I made. Uh, and um, this worked pretty well. And as you can see, I actually plotted down the skirt of this. And what I figured out is that there's a very sharp drop on the higher side, the very sharp drop on the higher side, as you can see here. And for the BFO, uh, I had to use, I had to pull the crystal off by 25 kilohertz with just a one PF capacitor. And this was proving to be unreliable because at times, so the one PF was with some crystals, not enough to make it oscillate at all. And later on, I switched from, um, a crystal oscillator to using the SI5351's output itself as one of the oscillators. Uh, then uh, the next thing that I did was to migrate this from 40 megahertz to 27, uh, uh, sorry, from 27 to 40 megahertz, uh, bought some crystals of Mauser. I'm sorry, this is, um, the left side is pixelated, but nevertheless, I put this into the, <laughs> SDR that I was developing. And here on the right, you can see the crystal filter. Now these crystals are not available in the HC uh, 49U format. They are SMD crystals and they were really, really impossible to solder. So uh, what I did was put a dab of solder and first fix it upside down. Um, it's uh, And 
and basically you know spot solder its its case onto the pcb onto the copper clad and then use extremely thin wires and solder those in as the wires to the crystal filter itself and this actually is giving me about 35 kilohertz of bandwidth and with this i knew that you know it would be possible to take 0 to 30 megahertz and up convert this to 40 so this is the simple uh diagram of the sdr as you can see that the sdr itself is fairly simple straightforward super head and i'll actually show you the entire circuit diagram so on characteristically here we start with the signal on the right hand side coming in through the low pass filter going through a kiss mixer uh, made out of uh, an fsa 3157 by the way i use only parts that you could find on mouser because mouser actually ships globally now for 20 dollars any amount of parts so i thought it would be best if we stuck to a design which could have all the parts which could be bought off mouser um these parts are available in other places as well but that was my condition so uh, it up converts to 40 you have a 40 megahertz crystal filter here and um uh, this crystal filter actually um, uses two crystals uh, two parallel crystals at the end and this is also due to dr gordon um, he calls it a quer filter quasi equiripple filter this makes the the tops very flat um, and this basically feeds to an to a bidirectional if amplifier i have not used resistors here in the collector loads but instead of it opted for transformers built on uh, ft3743 toroids and the reason for that is that we need much higher current um standing in these transistors for it to be able to handle uh the higher dynamic range and then the, you have a uh, detectors slash modulator and you'll also see on the right hand side here that there's a feedback amplifier used for the audio preamplifier which feeds to the sound card of the raspberry pi and this is a very interesting design um, it was designed just a couple of months ago by wes haver in the sense that the earlier designs that we used in direct conversion radios did not have a high dynamic range in the audio preamplifier section and this is a separate a new design which due, due to its feedback uh manages to lower the input impedance to exactly 50 ohms while uh, st still having a fairly high current in the in the transistors to be able to give a good dynamic range and in the center of this is si5351 which is actually feeding both as the vfo as well as the bfo there are some other interesting things here one of it is that you have a transverter output input here which could be used to uh, uh, you know extend this to vhf we also have one clock output left out here which uh, can be used for the vhf transporter or anything else and there's a tcxo uh, working here and i decided to switch from the a crystal to tcxo after looking at uh, hans's uh, qdx design and i said you know man this is so simple and brilliant to just use the tcxos they they aren't very costly at all they just are less than a dollar now that it just doesn't make sense to not use a tcxo as a base of your radio so this is the entire uh, radio really simple and the whole idea of an sdr is that the hardware is simple and you do a lot of your stuff for example you don't have the separate filters for fm cw ssb lower sideband upper sideband uh, you don't have different detectors they are all gone because everything is done in software and we'll get to how it works in the software in a bit so this is the power amplifier and the power amplifier is a little unusual the irf 510s are not the power amplifiers the irf z 24ns are the output transistors so this gives you 40 watts of output not just um you know 5 watts or 10 watts 40 watts all the way to 18 megahertz and from there it drops off and even at 30 megahertz you still have a useful 20 watts coming out from this circuit so this is a high power um radio and for those who would like to continue uh, qrp you'll just have to dial down the power now there's another very interesting thing here 
that we uh, spent a lot of energy uh, while building analog radios to see to it that the power chain has the same gain throughout from 160 meters to 30 meters, which is really very difficult because the the it's it's a ratio of one is to 20. That is, you know, from 1.8 megahertz to 30 megahertz, it's it's fairly large range of frequencies. So flattening the gain is very difficult. Um, with SDR, you just don't have to do that because in SDR, you can just have a lookup table in software where you reduce the amount of signal being generated, the amplitude, depending on the frequency. And, you know, voila, you have, uh, you know, equal output on all the frequencies. So it does not have, uh, uh, you know, much of gain control here because all the gain control is done in the, in the modulating signal, which is being used to drive the the diode modulator. Then this is the digital part of it. So on the left is the Raspberry Pi. And this is this here is a codec called WM8731. Now the interesting thing about why I picked up this particular codec is firstly it's a 24-bit codec, which means it's extremely silent with very high dynamic range. The second thing is that this codec is available as an assembled card which you can wire up. I mean, all the circuitry that you see around it is pre-wired and available to you from microelectronic as an audio codec proto card. You can purchase this online and just hook it up to your uh, Raspberry Pi, which is how I got started with the entire SDR effort. And I have an IF, uh, uh, a mic amplifier here as well. So this is a, this is a stereo codec and the left channel is used for receive and the right channel is used for transmit. So unlike a regular SDR where you need an INQ, because there is already a crystal filter here, the, the sidebands, the, the, the opposite sideband is already eliminated. All you have to do is digitize this in. So the left in takes the output of the demodulator, process it through the Raspberry Pi and the left out plays to the speaker. And the right in takes the input from the mic and feeds it out to the modulator. So uh, the reason why I chose this uh, topology is that I do a lot of satellite work. And in satellite work, you require full duplex work. So this particular circuit can in future also be used to do full duplex radios where you know one channel is transmitting the, and the other is simultaneously receiving the downlink. Um, Okay, now I haven't spoken about the software till now, and I will very quickly lead you in the last you know couple of minutes to the software. So the three things that I decided while building this SDR is that I would rewrite the entire software stack all over again instead of using the software which is already available. Because usually what happens is that the people who write SDR code write write it for a generic hardware which is not you know, completely uh, optimized for any particular architecture. Second was that it was extremely complicated. Um, it, ordinary hands couldn't understand it. So I decided that I would rewrite of the world's simplest SDR code. Uh, and anyone who has programmed Arduino should be able to understand this because that was my level of understanding of DSP when I started to uh, build uh, this SDR project of mine. Uh, so, uh, and you know, I mean, I have a very short attention span. So uh, the, the whole idea was that this code should be understandable so that it fits into a single page, right? I mean, a single A4 page, if I take a printout, it should be able to fit into that. And it should be easy to add features. You should be able to learn it. You should be able to hack it. So. That was actually um, the big win that I have, uh, you know, achieved with this SDR code. And I'm actually going to walk you through this code in the next five minutes. So it's very simply this, that we hams uh, tend to view signals in frequency domain. By that, what I mean is that I say that my VF4 is oscillating at five megahertz, or I say, I'll see you down at 7040 kilohertz or, you know, uh, whatever. So we essentially do not talk in terms of time domain, but we look at the band, we perceive the band as a spectrum of frequencies. 
So if you see the signal on the left, it's a, it's a two-tone signal, which you see on an oscilloscope, which is how we deal with them when we are building an analog radio. But if you see it on a spectrum analyzer, you see what you see on the right-hand side, which is in frequency domain. So if you imagine that we should be able to manipulate signals frequencies wise, then things would be much easier. That is, instead of having, let's say, a digitized signal where you say, okay, the signal was at X uh, at so and so time, then it went on to an amplitude of Y, then it fell down to Z, then it went to, you know, uh, again, amplitude of P, Q, etc., which is, you know, a, a wave described. Uh, as a, as a progression in time, instead of that, if you view it as various frequencies which are coming to you all at once, and you say, okay, that's the frequency, I've, those are the frequencies that I want to be picked up, translated to some other frequency, et cetera, that would be actually much easier for us to deal with, where you say, okay, I need a filter which works between 7010 and 7013 kilohertz, because you know I'm just interested in a three kilohertz slice there. So how do you do that? So the magic is simply one function that you should call from your code called FFT, Fast Fourier Transform. What it does is it takes a digitized signal and converts it into an array where um, an array of frequencies with amplitudes and phases of each frequency is sorted out for you separately. And now you can pick and choose which signals you want to keep and zero out the signals that you do not want. So I'll just show you how that is done here. So <clears throat> here it is. Uh, we are having the input coming in here from the from the uh, you know the codec, and we fill this into an array here. Uh, and the way we have to do this is if let's say thousand signals are coming in. You actually combine them with the previous thousand signals. And the reason why you do that is at the start of a sine wave, if there's an abrupt start, which is not at zero, but let's say at 100, you need a continuation saying that earlier it was 99 and now it's gone to 100. Otherwise, uh, the software might think that it's gone from zero to 100 and give a sharp click there because you know there's a sudden spike. So in order to avoid the software from thinking falsely that there are spikes, you basically show continuity from the previous set of samples which have come in. Anyhow, so you put all these samples into an array like this. And if you see the last line here, it says FFT execute. So you put all these samples which have come in, execute this, and this converts this into a an array of frequencies. So this is how it'll, uh, the unfiltered spectrum looks like, which is on the left. And here, as you can see in the center, there are these spikes which have grayed out, saying that this is the stuff that I don't want, and this is the stuff that I want. So I essentially zero in all the signals which are outside those that I want, and just keep those signals in, and I've filtered. So the, the filter is simply that. But you know, unfortunately, it doesn't work by just putting zeros everywhere else and letting the other signals stand. On the skirt of your bandwidth, you have to gradually lead the signal in and then gradually you know phase it out so instead of a, a rectangular block you need these gentle slopes so what you have to do is instead of just zeroing them in you essentially have another array where it's zeros all over the place and as you keep approaching the center of your bandwidth it starts going from zero and climbs to values closer to one stays at one for the flat top of your filter. And then from one, it starts declining again back to zero. And this shape is actually um, called a, a window function. And you essentially take the unfiltered spectrum and multiply it with another array of windows, uh, of windowed function. Then you have the signal that you wanted. And this signal is actually not, now, for example, if it was zero to, let's say, 10 kilohertz, you want these signals to be shifted down to start from zero kilohertz because you want it to be audible. All you need to do is you just need to shift the bins in which these frequencies are down below. And here is the code. It's easier to show this in the code. So first, we rotate these bins so that you know something which is at five kilohertz. Let's imagine you have the SSB signal from five to eight kilohertz. So now you move the, it down to zero to three kilohertz. So it's fairly simple here for people who know Arduino code. 
which is you're just moving this thing down. You're zeroing out the other band, uh, the other side band, and you're multiplying this with a windowing function. And that's it. You're done. Uh, you convert back from frequency domain into time domain. So it's just in you know five, seven steps, not more than 30 lines of code, and you finish all your SDR work here. Uh, and then you know you just take this, multiply it with the gain. By the way, you control the volume of your signal by just multiplying it with the number. If you multiply it with zero, the gain becomes zero, and you know the the speaker is muted. And if you let's say multiply it by one, it is you know maximum. So stuff like that. It's it's a fairly you know straightforward thing. And when you try transmitting, you do the opposite, which is you take stuff from the mic here, mic input, put it into this array. Uh, execute your FFT, uh, which converts it into frequencies. And then you shift, uh, you firstly window it. You, uh, this is the window function. And then you zero in um, the, the other side band and shift it to the frequency that you wanted, you know, within the 25 kilohertz band. And then just output it off to the uh, modulator this time. So it's really simple. Uh, it, it works pretty, you know, I, I was myself surprised at how simple this was. And this was actually made simple for me because I studied code, which was written by Phil Khan, uh, Kilo Alpha 9 Queen. Um, so it was his code. And the architecture of using a superhead uh, radio is not mine, really. Uh, this was actually, you know, explained by W7 Papa United Alpha PUA. Uh, uh, in the EMRFD, and he's one of the co-authors of uh, uh, of this. So Bob Larkin and and uh, Phil have been really, you know, instrumental in making me understand how SDR works. About three years ago, I had no clue of how they work, and it's been a huge learning experience. So this is the current. Uh, uh, it's, this is not current. This is the last version of the circuit board which we designed for this. Uh, there's a new version which I will show you here, and this is the SDR as it looks right now. This is the prototype, uh, and um, this is what you need to do. Um, uh, you know, read experimental methods in RF design to learn as SDR work, and these articles, four articles, each of not more than three pages or four pages each. Uh, they were published in QEX. They are available for free download on ARRL. They are a really good introduction without any technical jargon or much of it by Gerald, uh, who went down to found uh, the Flex Radio. This was the original articles which started the entire SDR movement among us. Of course, the uh, W7ZOI.net is a great source for uh, radio design work even now. You know, you have to just keep digging into this website to discover more and more things. And for people who just want to study DSP from end to end, dspguide.com is a really well-written book for engineers and hackers, especially. Uh, it simplifies everything down. And this book is available entirely online, so you don't have to buy this book. If you, if you want to, which I think you should, um, you can buy the book, but all the chapters are available as HTML pages here. So the three things that you have to do actually to understand the SDR is understand receiver design, uh, more important than the transmitter design, and how the Fourier transforms work, and no C language programming. So if, I mean, these are the three different things that you have to bring in together to do uh, the SDR work. And now I'll actually um, show you um, the SDR work. I have a clip here. Uh, I'll show you that, and then I'll end with that. Just give me a second, and I will see if I can play the clip for you. Okay, so this is the radio working here, you can see. And they, what you see is that the radio is also working on FT8 here. And there are no wires connecting them at all. Uh, everything is done internally. The audio is routed from SBITX to WSJTX. So um, that's decoding some new stuff. And here it's a, it's a capacitive touch screen, of course. And the way you work is that you touch something here. 
um, to change it, and then you use the second encoder to touch that uh, to move that. Whereas the knob on the right will do the main tuning. So um, it's actually pretty easy to uh, learn to use, which is you touch a particular control here, and then you use the left knob to turn it. If you're a left-hand person, then you can swap the uh, knobs around or you know e even change the layout of the front panel. And uh, it's a fairly basic SDR right now. Uh, not everything works uh, in here, but um, it's actually pretty functional and I like it because everything is big here and everything works fairly well. I have a band stack. Um, I'm able to pipe things in and here we are back to doing this. And as you'll see here, uh, if you note, it's actually receiving the FT8 on LSB. That's a bug in the code. Uh, because it's an inverting conversion. So it's actually LSB. Uh, uh, the LSB is showing as USB here in the user interface. But this is the big thing that um, we are able to put all the digital modes right here on the um, radio itself. So uh, that is the, that's the radio uh, working. And let me go back to this, you know, in the end, I just wanted to say this, that the SBTEX details will be available on my website very soon. Uh, it's a constant shift uh, because I'm constantly evolving it into one thing or the other. So uh, view to esc.com is where you'll get all the details about the SBTEX. It's going to be completely open source, of course, both software as well as hardware. And github.com slash afarhan is where my all my software is. And we'll continue to discuss this on the Bitex group, which is groups.io slash g slash bitex20. And of course, the three people involved uh, with this for the last couple of years were Wes, Bob, and Phil. And... Um, this is very much their project as much as it's mine. Uh, I constantly keep harassing them and, uh, you know, going after them to, you know, develop circuits for me or to help me understand one thing or the other. Uh, my my um, understanding still continues to be, you know, uh, fairly primitive. Uh, but I hope that this project, you know, spurs more of us to get into this and to improve this and to keep... Uh, developing this and have fun so uh that's uh, about it and you know if there are questions i will take them and um, you know thanks dave and tammy for uh, this wonderful opportunity rsgb has been a great influence on me as i said that you know years of me going through uh, rsgb books at the british council library really helped me in and especially you know Pat Hawker's um, Amateur Radio Techniques. I mean, that was a book that did not deal with big radios, but dealt with specific, you know, block diagrams. And that really was uh, the key for me to understand how these things, you know, work together. And as you saw that here, uh, I just built one circuit at a time, test it out completely and document it, which is pretty much, you know, what Pat taught us to do. So I, uh, I, I'll push it back to uh, you then, uh, David, so you take it up, and if there are questions, I'd be happy to take up. Thank you very much. I'm going to let you have a, a breath and a drink as well. I should just explain <laughs> to everyone, I'm not going to labour it, but it is now just gone 3 a.m. in the morning, I reckon, where you are. So yeah. I, I don't think I'd be as bright <laughs> to be able to present at 3 in the morning. So do have a little bit of a break. So um, this is a great opportunity for you at home. I've got a couple of sort of comments and suggestions, lots and lots of compliments, as you'd probably expect. Okay. But if you have a question uh, for Farhan and, or you've got a comment or anything like that, this is the time to get them on to us as well, either on the uh, YouTube chat or on BATC. Um, I'm going to start with one, though. I mean, you said okay. that uh, all of this is going to be on the, uh, you know, in the GitHub and everything. It's all open source. Are you going to be making a kit available is the first part of the question. And then the second part, as you can probably guess, will be, say, when? Okay. So, um the kit's almost here. Okay, in fact, I'll, um, the kit is going to be here. Um, okay, it's, it's still strapped in here, but you know, that's ah. the 
right board so uh, i i am planning this to be a kit because there are too many components which have to go in together but nevertheless the idea of uh, the sbtex is that the software is completely uh, usable on any superhead so you can take your regular superhead transceiver that you have change the crystal filter to a 25 megahertz crystal filter and that's actually documented already here in a, you know it's it's pretty easy to do and you're in business right your radio will become an sdr so you can actually retrofit it to a lot of radios in fact i have retrofitted it to a micro bitex by changing the crystal filter from 11 megahertz to a 27 megahertz crystal filter using the same place you know just pull out these crystals and put in 27 megahertz crystals with different coupling capacitances so the idea is not to limit it to what might be produced as a kit and i hope that other people would produce this kits as well but to adapt this to even the radios that you already have so that way actually it's it's pretty interesting it's just i think a lot of us getting started and by the way I, i'm i think i'll be the only one but i i can relate to everything your story of how you got involved with electronics those early days of scavenging components trying to find right. some germanium traces now that was exactly me but i would say that <laughs> For me, and I guess that a lot of people watching now as well, where the bit that left me behind is the software when it starts coming into this, because clearly you were right. very much a hardware man until relatively mm. recently. I think you said two or three years ago, you wouldn't yeah. have even started this SDR part of the journey. True. So I think a kit is probably going to be important because it gives somewhere people to start that they think they might be able to get that to work. And then they can tinker and experiment, I, w I would have thought. Yeah. So what made so, you um, get into right. the software? Was it, sorry, was it Bob and Phil? Were they the people and Wes that they yeah, were inspired yeah, you to yeah. have a look at uh, the software? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, just before that is that this board is the audio codec board, right? So this plugs in here into the Raspberry Pi. And uh, you could actually buy this codec board uh, even from microelectronics, although uh, it, it doesn't just go onto this board. You'll have to you know, make an adapter for their board. So uh, the idea is that with this, uh, the software is already, you know, on the on the card here, which you can just plug in here, and you, you know, you'd be in business. So uh, what you need is something like that to get you started off without having to bother with soldering, etc. Yeah. yeah. So uh, one of the things which I wanted to do was to get this thing going on Raspberry Pi, and I started having a lot of online discussions with uh, Bob Larkin, W7PUA. He's written the the chapters of on DSP in the in that seminal book and um, about three years ago i actually you know went down to portland and spent a rainy day with him uh, and you know i mean i brought my junk he brought his whole junk and we you know sort of pulled everything out and you know showed it to each other etc so that really uh, set it up for me to start doing this. And this is actually very important. Uh, you know, when you're learning, you need a mentor of sorts or you, or you need somebody who's done, who's been ahead of the curve uh, with you to get you started off. Uh, and, uh, you know, so Bob really uh, helped me do that. And uh, then a couple of years ago, you know, I mean, one of my interests is to also, you know, build satellites. So I was in the AMSAT symposium and I was standing and I found myself standing right next to Phil Kahn and I was so in awe of that moment that I said, oh my God, you know, I'm standing next to Kahn. So uh, probably, uh, David, you remember that uh, when we started internet, we had run this thing called Kahn.exe on our, on our PCs mm. under DOS to connect it to the internet. Yes. So that was actually yes. written by Phil Kahn. So yeah. uh, he's a guy who wrote the TCP IP stack for the PCs and for a long time, all of us got onto internet because of that. He's written all the um, codecs for uh, or the modern software for the AMSAT satellite. So, you know, I said, you know, what a pleasure and, you know, honor to, you know, be with you. And I told him about this project of mine doing the Raspberry Pi. So he actually has been developing Raspberry Pi radios, uh, receive only, but his stuff is really brilliant. Uh, and what he does is that he is able to run six or seven radios of the same digitized thing. So within that 30 kilohertz, I can be actually um, demodulating FT8 on one side, um, you know, doing CW decoding on another while actually listening to ra you know, or rack chewing with somebody on SSB in the center of the pass band. And he's actually built those really complex uh, SDRs. And I actually uh, didn't want to go uh, that far in this because I wanted to keep them very simple so that for the rest of us to be able to understand the software. 
So Phil Khan is one of the best, you know, DSP brains around. Mm. And Bob is a guy who can elucidate these things and enunciate them very, very easily. And you know, really bring it down to a level where I could understand and, you know, re relate the stuff. For example, uh, I mean, Bob explained to me that FFT has to be thought of like a diode mixer. So he, he said that, you know, okay, what FFT does is mathematically speaking, it runs an oscillator or a local oscillator across the signal that you've given in uh, and narrow filters it, low pass filters it at the other end. So it's much like a direct conversion radio with somebody tuning the signal very fast. Then I understood it. Okay, yeah, now I know what you're talking about. So what FFT essentially does is it mixes, it spins, uh, a number of oscillators all parallelly and gives you outputs at various you know frequencies by detecting them as direct conversion radio so you have to he taught me to think of fft which is that core of sdr as a number of parallel direct conversion receivers running i mean it takes a ham to understand uh, you know uh, what the other ham is going through and be able to explain it in those terms. Sure, yes. Well, yeah, and I can tell you that just as he's inspired you and helped you, you're certainly inspiring others here to have a go. I'm going to start with a couple of, uh, certainly a question here okay. came in fairly early on uh, from Neville ZL2BNE. You are reaching all over the place at the moment. We've got also a gentleman okay. from Croatia watching. But anyway, Neville's question was, one principle behind the BITEX seems to be simplicity what tipped you to favor double conversion rather than a simpler single conversion design? So, um, as I you know, talked about the minima there, I tried actually doing this with a single conversion, uh, but I just simply could not um, you know, filter out the images uh, when it came to a general coverage receiver. I mean, the, the Bitex was, uh, was 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 a fairly simple uh, narrow band design for one band but how do you go multi band you know um, and really what i had done was i had set myself up to not use my ft817 i i mean you know i have a love and hate relationship uh, with the ft87 it's so good it's so compact um, but it's a commercial set that i did not want to use so how do i you know get away from it and have a general coverage HF radio. That was really my big challenge. And um, one, and you know, I actually gave in to um, a dual conversion design at the end of it because there was no other way to do it. Now that the 40 megahertz crystals are available, I did, did try making an SSB filter at 40 megahertz, but it's impossible to do that at such high frequencies. You know, the the bandwidth is simply too much to you know uh, condense it down to a single conversion set. But however, there is um, a BITEX can be done with a low pass filter in the front end with 25 megahertz IF, I realized. So at least up to 0 to 14 megahertz, that is, you know, 80, um, 60, uh, 40 meters, 30 meters, up to 20 meters can actually be handled with a single low pass filter. Otherwise, you have to build an entire bank of band pass filters uh, to be switched. And getting them tuned you know firstly winding 30 toroids and then you know having a having to align them would be a nightmare for an average builder so really it's trying to keep things simple for the for for uh, the builder in terms of being able to not build so many filters to be able to get away with a single low pass filter is what drove me to a double conversion design one of the uh, thank you and one of the questions that i was going to ask you was Clearly you and me, and I'm sure many people watching, were inspired as young people to get hold of those uh, radio constructor magazines and, and practical wireless and things like that and, and start to build things. But now in the 2021, it can be quite hard to inspire young people like us, uh, as we were, to get experimenting with something like this. So do you possibly see that this coding, which is a, th a feature of young people's lives nowadays, is that, could that be a way of getting young people into the hobby? Um, I would imagine so, I would imagine so. I mean, the way we build radios is changing very fast, right? I mean, for instance, now with the computers available, we simulate a lot of circuitry you know, online to see how it works. And there are a lot of competency coming in in the digital domain. So I, I would imagine that that is one of the ways to do it, but you know, 
our, our, our fundamental uh, work as radio hams is to get the signals out, you know, out, out the antenna. And for that, there will be, uh, the core of our competency will still be analog design, right? So, um, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not too much of a stretch to imagine that. I mean, for instance, that, you know, now I'm 55 and, you know, I've taken up cycling. There was no need for me to cycle if there's a car at home, but I still cycle. Um, I, I still like to, you know, solve mathematical puzzles. I, I, I still like to do stuff that I don't have to do. And as, um, you know, uh, 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 silent key old man, uh, Dr. B uh, you know, Reverend Dobbs had said that, uh, you know, ham radio, among other things, is a thing that you don't have to do, but you get joy of doing that simply because you don't have to do it, but you still do it, right? He said, in a day, you should do one thing uh, which you don't have to do, but you just do it to please yourself. So uh, there is a lot of pleasure in melting sol solder still. And I see that a lot of young people, once they get the hang of it, they really enjoy doing that. In my local club, I see a lot of young people come in and, you know, uh, for them, the joy of, let's say, building an oscillator and being able to listen to the oscillator somewhere else on a radio or even the oscillator spans the, the city, right? A couple of kilometers down, uh, you know, uh, down the range uh, does inspire people. So I think building radios to be able to communicate with something that they've built on their own uh, can be pitched as as really a, a wonderful activity uh, that you say that, you know, okay, you've got internet, you've got phone, but what if you can build this yourself? Much like, you know, people would like to build their own aircraft or people would like to build their own homes or shacks or, you know, whatever. I mean, we, we do a lot of things which we'd like to build, you know, do on our own. We go hiking when we can, you know, go flying. We go cycling when we could, we could do motoring because there is, there's this whole idea of being, um, you know, of having sovereign, uh, you know, uh, power over yourself for, to be able to do something on your own. And that's what Ham Radio tells you that you can communicate with another individual across the world without using any of the infrastructure of the corporates, of the telecoms, etc. Yes. So right. I think it's, it's, it's sort of political. It's, uh, you know, if I, if, I can, if I can use the word of saying, you know, I can communicate on my own. I don't need anybody else to do that. No, and I think you're right. The RSGB are very keen as well to encourage people to still keep doing construction because otherwise it's an art that I think we, we're going to lose. Yeah. Um, and, and if I could just put a little plug in at this moment, a few weeks ago we had the RSGB convention, which was online again mm -hmm. this year. But we had a wonderful right. talk by a young man, um, Dan M0WUT, who gave us a whole lovely video and a, and a, and a live Q&A on soldering. And it covered everything wow. from the very basic uh, resistors to write to some of the surface mount chips and things. And, and uh, I think we all learn how to do that. So That's hopefully fabulous. we combine the yeah. two together with maybe buying a, an Espitec circuit board from you and then watching that video. Right. Um, you know, that, that, yeah. that will really encourage people to make something. Because you say there is a special joy about making something yourself. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things which hooks on a lot of young people, uh, and actually uh, just two days ago, I was doing a, uh, a talk at an engineering college and I actually showed them, um, you know, my son's gaming setup. My son has a three monitor gaming setup, right? I mean, he with uh, a liquid cooled CPU and the works, right? He's extremely serious about his gaming. And then I flipped to the next slide which showed a contesting station and the entire, you know, auditorium full of these, uh, you know, Young people, they just went, oh, wow, what's that? So, you know, they saw this huge thing, <laughs> except that there were 50-year-old people, you know, pounding on the keys, uh, contesting. And then when I flipped to the next slide, which showed that antenna farm, which is a, you know, 100-foot tower with uh, faced arrays for 20 meters, they were completely blown away uh, at contesting. So, you know, there is a, the segue from gaming to uh, you know, contesting as much as there is a segue from uh, the make of uh, community to home brewing. And there's a segue from, uh, you know, Arduino hackers to doing SDR. So, I mean, we'll have to make these transitions. Very important. Yes. Yes, indeed. 
I think we need to leave it there, really, because I think we ought to let you get to bed before the sun starts to rise, which will be an hour, hour or two away for you. But just leave you with a few comments. There's been lots of wonderful comments, and I can't read them all, I'm afraid. But just to sum up, um, from Paul, G0OER, a wonderful presentation, Farhan. I'm really looking forward to seeing the final hardware design and getting going with SPIDX myself. Uh, Graham said, a, a fascinating journey from simple, small building blocks to the finished designs. What an inspiration. Thank you for sharing your passion with us all. And finally, I'm going to leave it with uh, this from uh, Terry, G3VFC, who says, truly self-training plus ham spirit. Well done. And thank you for the inspiration. Wow. And, and That's thank, really touching. And that goes, I'm sure, for everybody who's watched tonight and also, of course, the hundreds of people and thousands even that are going to watch it, this recording of this in the next few weeks. But Farhan, we're really grateful for you joining us tonight, sharing us the whole journey from the very basic single transistor circuits that you started with to what you're coming up now. We can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you very much indeed, Farhan. Okay. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Bye-bye. And for us too. Thank you very much. And that ends tonight's webinar. And thanks once again to our guest, Ashar Farhan, VU2 ESE. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this tonight to date and that you'll be able to join us next time. We'll be finding out how to use the analog devices Pluto and the Raspberry Pi 4 for amateur TV and narrowband applications. If you'd like to see details of that and other webinars or to send any comments or feedback, please visit rsgb.org forward slash webinars. And a reminder that if you subscribe to the RSGB's YouTube channel, you'll be notified of all upcoming Tonight at 8 webinars, as well as other new videos and presentations from the Society on a wide range of amateur radio topics. But until next time, this is David G7URP signing off and clear. Bye-bye.